Amy Richards with the hand clap of praise. Hallelujah. Come and praise the Lord with a hand clap. Jesus, it's about you tonight. Lord, it's all about you. Lord, we come into this place singing the prayer of God. something tonight. We don't serve a dead God. Yeah. We don't serve a God that when he was put in the tomb, he remained there. But my Bible says that he was put into a borrowed tomb. The reason it was borrowed is he had plans on coming out of that tomb. And on that third day after he knocked on hell's door and he took the keys to death and hell. give honor tonight to Pastor Hamilton. What a sweet, sweet, precious lady of God that you people are privileged to call your pastor. She is a great, great lady. She just oozes humbleness. Just her words flow with meekness. And in the beauty of holiness, you can tell that God just ordained her for this time, for this people, and for this city. Yeah. You say, are you worried there's more than one holiness church in town? No, thank God for it. Yeah. I wish there was more. Yeah. You say, but we got room. That's all right. God's got plans. Yeah. I don't believe God give anyone a vision for a building of this size. For it not to be filled with hungry hearts and souls. Amen. You say no one wants holiness anymore. Why not? You and I are here. You and I live in the same world as everybody else. There's some estimated 55,000 people in the city of Wilson. I will not get comfortable with a, with a moderate church size. Because the church is not the building anyway. The church is going around to your jobs, to your schools, to your workplaces. You are the temple of the Holy Ghost. And so I say tonight, I've come to encourage you and to uplift you as a church family. And with the help of the Lord, I pray that I do that tonight. I'm going to be going to the book of Isaiah. The book of Isaiah chapter 64 and verse number 6. Isaiah 64. In verse number six, while you're going there with me, I'm already. You know what's wrong with most of our generation now that's coming up? Is they're lazy. They're lazy in their everyday habits. They're lazy in what they do. And it carries over into the church. <laughs> I told our chapel service today, the number one reason that people leave church is this. They claim that their family is not being fed there. And I posed this question to him. I said, my Bible says that a man that will not work Amen. does not eat. Amen. Could it be that the reason why our families are not being fed is because there is no work going on? When you get involved in the church and you get your hand to the plow and you get involved in the work of the Lord and you have something invested in it, you're not so quickly removed from it. Amen. And so tonight I just want to encourage your heart. I want to speak to you for just a few minutes. Isaiah 64 and verse number 6. Very familiar passage of scripture tonight. But we are all as an unclean thing. And all of our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. And we all do fade as a leaf. And our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. For just a few minutes tonight, I want to preach this thought into your hearing. 
From rags to righteous. From rags to righteous. Can we pray together? Lord, I love you right now. Lord, and I pray for your anointing to fall heavy on this service tonight. Lord, I pray that you would anoint these lips of clay that's bringing forth your word. God, I simply want to be a voice piece for you. And I pray, Lord, that you would anoint me tonight to speak words of life and encouragement to this great church body. I pray, Lord, that you would move in a mighty, mighty way tonight in this place. I love you. I praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. amen. And amen. It's so good, again, to be in the house of God. So good to see Sister Pat with me. Um, she's just an, always been an encouragement to me. Um, she told me right before service, she said, I'd love to be able to watch how God's grown your ministry and anointed it. And she said, God's brought you a long way. And I looked back at her and said, thank God. I'm glad I'm not where I used to be. <laughs> I'm glad that I'm growing in God. I'm glad that God sees fit to use me because otherwise I'm worthless. If you're not doing something for God tonight, I challenge you Amen. to become somebody. Yeah. Become a winner. Amen. Become godly. Yeah. And see what God will do in your life. Right here, I've heard this scripture preached um, from the time I've been in the church all of my life. And, and, and I've heard this scripture preached many, many, many times. And, and I don't know that I've ever heard it preached correctly the way that it is read. Most of the time when you hear this scripture read, it says our righteousness is as filthy rags. That's how I've always heard it preached. When I, when I started to study this scripture, I realized that there was an ES added on to the end of righteousness. And I began to wonder why uh, here this was, this was taking place in this scripture. And so as I began to study Pastor Hamilton, I looked up and I was, I was wondering how many other times in the King James Bible that this word was mentioned. And there was only three times. There was here in the book of Isaiah 64 and 6, Ezekiel 33 and 13, and Daniel 9 and 18 were the only three times that righteousnesses were mentioned in the Bible. And every time that it mentioned this word in this capacity, it was not talking about the righteousness of God, but it was talking about the acts of man. You got to understand something tonight. We're not here to, to view the acts of man and we're not here to view one another. But the reason why we come to church on a Friday night is to lift up the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And it's all about Him tonight. You got to understand something about me. I see no glory of my own. But if my Lord is saying to be lifted up, my word says that He would draw all men unto Him. And so I I don't want to know my acts and I don't want to know your acts but I want to know about God's righteousness speaks of men's works not God's righteousness so I turned to old Noah Webster to look up what righteousness meant righteousness from Noah Webster's dictionary is simply to be free from guilt and then I typed in that little ES on the end of it. And what popped up on my computer screen about blew me off my chair. Because just adding those two little letters of ES changed the entire meaning of righteousness. To free from guilt to this. The action. Acting as if you were free from guilt. There's a whole lot of people in the church today that are acting like they are free from guilt and they are acting like they are in the kingdom of God and they are acting like they are called of God but we need some more people that say it's not about my righteousnesses it's not about my actions it's not about my good deeds it's not about how good I can act talk or look in the house of God but it's about can I lift up a holy God a righteous God Jesus. I don't want to be called acting. 
<laughs> you may be seated tonight. There is none holy as the Lord. First Samuel 2 and 2. There is none holy as the Lord, for there is none beside thee, neither is there any rock like our God. Right. <laughs> neither is there any rock like our God. There's none beside of Him. There's none before Him. And there'll be none after Him. He stands alone as the great reigning supreme God of all creation. He is the master of all and He is the creator of you and I. There is nothing too hard for the God we serve. There is nothing too far out of His reach. There is nothing that He will hold back from His children that love Him with all of their heart, soul, mind, and strength. But we've got to stop acting like we're in the church and we've got to stop acting like we believe that God can do anything and we just got to trust and know that He can do anything. Only God's righteousness will change people. You acting righteous won't change anybody. In fact, you can't change anybody anyway. It is amazing to me that we as a church have such judgmental spirits of people that walk through our doors after we have cried out to God, the sinner of life. And yet we try to dictate to God how He sends it. I heard a statement a couple years ago, Pastor, and I'll, it will stick with me the rest of my life. There's a man out of, out of uh, Kissimmee, St. Cloud, Florida. He made this statement. He said, if you will reach for the ones that nobody wants, God will send you the ones that everybody wants. We don't need to wait for a millionaire to walk through the doors of the church to have revival. But if a poor pauper and a homeless man or a homeless woman walks in off the street and she's not looking right and not smelling right and not talking right, it is not up to you and I to clean her up. God called us to be dishes of men, not to clean them up before they get in the church. It's all about His righteousness and not our actions. You may be seated tonight. It's all about His righteousness, but not our actions. In fact, our actions, what the Bible refers to as the filthy rags, is our actions, not God's righteousness. There's nothing filthy about His righteousness. It becomes filthy when we take it and pervert it. When we adulterate the gospel and water it down to suit people's lifestyles. That's when it becomes a filthy rag. And that's when it becomes unholy. For there is none holy as the Lord. <laughs> there is none like our God. His righteousness is everlasting. It will endure to every generation from now to the coming of Christ, which I believe with all of my heart, soul, mind, and strength is not many days from now. I don't believe we are in the last days. I believe we are in the last hours. I believe that this dispensation of time is about to wrap up. I believe at any moment, and it might even be tonight, I believe that Jesus can step out on the clouds of glory, put one foot on the mountain and one foot in the sea, and say, time shall be no more. And it's going to be up to you tonight whether you make up your mind to walk out of this place with assurance and knowing that you've done all you know how to do to live for God and to love God. Or you can sit back in your complacent state of mind and say, oh, everything's going to be all right. I've got the rest of my life to live. You don't have the promise of tomorrow and so tonight it is a promise to you that if you will repent yeah. let's go back to the generation that's lazy you may be seated we've become a generation that's too lazy to repent <laughs> repentance used to come with tears Repentance used to come with wailing and crying out to God for forgiveness. Now we accept anything as old they repented. 
a half hearted, half hand lifted. Oh God, please. Please, you know what I've done? Because we don't want to name sin anymore in the church. We want to cover it all by telling everybody that we serve a merciful and a loving God. He is loving and He is merciful. But He is a righteous God and His anger is fierce. The Bible says He is terrible. You don't want to kindle the anger of God. Oh, He's loving. He's a just God. Somebody said, I don't think it's fair the way that God does His people. You know what? I'm glad that we don't always serve a fair God because if He was a fair God and He lived up to His word, word for word, you and I would not be here tonight because the wages of sin is death. While we were yet in our sins, Christ loved us. He loved us enough that He died on Galgotha's Hill and He was crucified for you and I so that you and I in, in September of 2012 might have an opportunity to live for Him and serve Him and not have to die and go to a devil's hell. But we can lift up our hands in surrendrance and cry out to Him and say, God, I repent. God, I repent of every sin in my life. Lord, I pray that You would cleanse me. God, I pray that You would wash me. God, I pray Say, well, my sins aren't all that bad. They're not all that good either. You may be seated. They're not all that good either. We now we categorize sin as big sins and small sins. We can preach from behind the pulpit, don't be a liar. But we get scared when somebody says, Don't be homosexual. Because we're afraid that it might offend somebody. They're not afraid of offending my family. They're not afraid of offending my, my five-year-old daughter when they sit, when she sees them walking through the mall holding hands and wondering, Daddy, why is this happening? They're not afraid to offend me. So I'm not afraid to stand in a pulpit under the anointing of the Holy Ghost and say if it was wrong for Sodom and Gomorrah, it's wrong now. You may be seated. <laughs> but it's not up to us to act like that we are the judge. We're not. You and I judge nothing. The greatest prejudice you can have in your life is prejudice against yourself. Because only you can control your actions. Only you are in control of how you live your life. I'm training my daughter in the ways of holiness and righteousness and serving God and loving God and worshiping God and praising Him through your ups and through your downs. But one day it's coming that it's going to be her decision. I can only take her so far and I can only do so much. There's going to be a day that I have to nudge her out of the boat and say it can work for Peter. If, if Peter can trust him, so can you. There might be a time when you start sinking, but all you have to do is reach. There's something about lifting your hands and surrendering to God. There's a peace that will come over you like you've never known before. Why? Because you're surrendering totally to Him. I've never been watching the show Cops. And somebody yelled out, Freeze! Put your hands up. And they go, Get your hands up. Somebody yells, Freeze! And has a gun pointed at me. They're going up. Please, for the love of God, don't shoot me. <laughs> then why don't we take our walk with God that seriously? Because if you're not willing to submit, if you're not willing to surrender, you're playing Russian roulette with your walk with God. I'm feeling too good in here tonight. I'm not going to get in trouble. <laughs> All my life, I've always heard the Scripture preached. And all that they were trying to do is downgrade and get rid of the rags. We preach.
preach about the rags is this thing we need to get out of our life. When in fact, I want to turn it around tonight. And I want to tell you, you don't need to get rid of the rags. The rags do serve a purpose. It said that our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. A filthy rag tells me one thing. Ready for this deep revelation? If it's a filthy rag, somebody's been using it to cling with. A rag don't get filthy on its own. So obviously somebody's using it to clean something in their life. I would rather have a dirty rag in my life and my life be good with God than to have a perfectly clean form of righteousness but yet my heart is black as coal. I would rather have a filthy rag than to have nothing to hold on to. <laughs> you may be seated tonight. A dirty rag means somebody's been cleaning. You want to know why the majority of people use a rag when they clean? Is to keep their hands clean. Well, what in the world is the purpose of clean hands in the church? I'm glad you asked. Just so happens I have a scripture for you tonight. Psalms 24 and verse 4. He that hath clean hands and a pure heart who hath not lifted up his soul into vanity, nor sworn deceitfully, he shall receive the blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. We're not lifting up the filthy rags tonight, but without them, you and I would be able to receive the righteousness of God because our hands would be stained and filthy with the cares of this life. But it's because of the filthy rags that we can come in with clean hands and pure hearts and stand before God's presence and say, put out, put out, put out, put out of my life. Praise God, you may be seated. It takes more than just your hands to clean with. It takes a good rag. There ain't nothing that will clean a toilet better than a rag. Nasty, ain't it? One of the worst jobs in house cleaning is cleaning the toilet. But you know what? If you neglect it, it's going to get even nastier. Think about what goes on in there. I know we chuckle and laugh. We talk about the bathroom. Get real, we need it. I'm so glad I don't have to go to the outhouse. I'm glad I've got toilets in my home. And I'm glad they're clean. I'm glad to know that I don't have to worry about going in there and there's rings around it all the time. I'm glad somebody's humble enough to hit their knees and clean it. Without ever cleaning it, it won't ever stay clean. You know what goes out through the toilet? <laughs> All the waste of everything that your body did not see fit to digest. All the unnecessary stuff that you put into your mouth. That your body didn't even want to digest. Has just left you through the toilet. Our prayer for the church needs to change to this. God purchase. God cleanse us. God, I need you to take away the sin in my life. You see, repentance without turning from your sin is simply saying you're sorry and you're planning to do it again. But true repentance is saying, God, I'm sorry for what I've done and I pray that you would take the waste out of my life and you would take the junk out of my life and you would cleanse me and wash me and make me pure and holy. Did you know that if you leave waste in your body long enough that it will start to poison you? You may be seen. Leave it in your life long enough that it will start to poison you. You better get rid of that junk. 
You better get rid of that little thing that's sneaking in your life that seems so insignificant, but all of a sudden it's like a snowball effect that starts at the top of the mountain. You can start with a little snowball and roll it off the mountain. By the time it gets to the bottom, it's an avalanche. You say, well, who are you to judge me? I've already told you I'm not the judge tonight. But there is one that you will stand before his judgment seat. And what you bring before the judgment seat, I got news for you tonight. You will answer for. Amen. You will have to be held accountable for what you've done with your life. Amen. I would rather come before him with clean hands Amen. and a pure heart and say, God, I feel like you've cleaned me out. I feel like you've stripped me down until I'm absolutely nothing good. This is where God starts working. You want to know where God will work in your life? You let Him get you down to the bare essentials of who you are. And you'll realize that you're nothing and you're no one without the presence of God. And it's when He gets you to that point that He starts to build you up. And He starts to remake you and remold you. And make you into what He wants you to be. Not what man says you need to be. Not what a woman tells you to be. But what God wants you to be. Tonight we need to get past man's opinion. And we need to get past trying to please man. Yes, we need to have favor with God and man, but we need to have favor with God above all else. And when you find favor with God, you're going to have favor with man. You're going to find favor with man. But if you want good favor and you want true favor, find it in God. Best way to clean a toilet is to get down on your knees with that old rag and start to scrub. Stick your hand in places you don't want to stick it. Sometimes God's going to put you in places you don't want to be, but it's up to you what you make out of it. You can try scrubbing bubbles. You can try those cleaning ones they got now. Oh, you just clip them on the side, let them run around, and it's supposed to clean just as good off food. They don't clean nearly as good as you getting down on your hands and knees and you scrubbing that thing. I don't want to try some new way of religion. I don't want to try some new way to be saved. I want to stick to the salvation of the Bible. I want to stick to the salvation of the apostles. I want to stick to the salvation. The way I still have to repent for the things I've done wrong. And I still have to answer for those things.
of family you come from, it don't matter what kind of sin you walk in here tonight with in your life, if you will turn it over to God like those people have done in this place tonight, God will take your sins and cast them as far as the east is from the west and you'll never have to deal with them again. You'll never have to worry with them again. I believe that there's a God in this place. I don't believe he's done with this church.
Amen. Amen. But sweet Amen. How can you? Amen. The man of God gave us the word. God has appeased the church. That means I'm not going to die.